Let us pray. Father God of mercy and compassion, we ask now for Jesus' sake that you will send us the Holy Spirit to be our great teacher. Oh God, please enlighten our understanding now and bring to light the hidden things that are made revealed in your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated, please. Now tonight's lesson is entitled The Truth About the Word of God. Do we all have our lessons? The Truth About the Word of God. Now, as we begin each subject matter, we always want to begin something from truth. A powerful quotation from truth. This one's kind of chipping in now. From truth. Let me... All right, from truth. Now, this is from Mark Twain. We, we all know who Mark Twain was, right? All right. Mark Twain once said now, he says, I always tell the truth so I don't have to remember what I just said. That is profound. I always tell the truth so I don't have to remember what I just said. That is a good principle, amen, for us to live by. In a recent survey, your handout says now, in a test of high school students, eight out of nine could not name three prophets of the Old Testament. And 10 out of 18 could not name three of Christ's disciples here in America, in the public schools. It is said in one elementary school of 351 out of 1,373 had never heard of the Ten Commandments. And in one university, 7% of the students could not name a single book from the Old Testament. Although some of the great principles of the Bibles are commonly known and underline our whole society structure, ignorance of this book and its truths and its teachings are appalling. Friends, the sad reality is that we live in a Time magazine, Jet magazine, Ebony magazine, um, Oprah magazine, People magazine reading age. But we don't live in a Bible reading age. And the sad reality is that most of the people who are looking for answers to life's perplexing questions, they have Bibles in their homes, on coffee table, in bookcases, all over this world, gathering dust, when if they would just read it, God would give answers to their perplexing questions. So tonight we're going to take a look at this wonderful book, the book called the Bible. Now question one in your handout says now, now what is the Bible composed of? You're going to search, what is it composed of? Fill in now, right? Now we've learned that there are, fill in now, that there are six, six books in the entire Bible. We're filling in the yellow. Do we all have a pen? Yes, but if you don't have a pen, please raise your hand. Please, okay, I should help us out now. Everyone needs a pen, and guess what? This pen is yours. Please bring it back every night, amen? We all need a pen to write with, right? We're filling in the blanks now. In most cases, the yellow, right? Now, there are 66 books in the entire Bible. Fill it in now, right? There are 39 books in the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament commences with Genesis and ends with Malachi. It was written in Hebrew. Did you get that? Yeah. These are facts about the Word of God. All Bible-believing Christians should know. Then we have the New Testament. There are, fill it in now, there are 27 books in the New Testament. The New Testament commences with Revelation, with Matthew, pardon me, and it ends with Revelation, which was written in Greek. Friends, you got to know this. Now look at this in interesting fact now. During the first 2,500 years of creation of the human family, there was no written Bible. No written Bible. Therefore, those who had been taught of God communicated their knowledge to others, how? Verbally. And it was handed down from father to son through successive generations, brothers and sisters, right? The preparation of the written word began in the time of Moses. So there was no written word 
everything was done orally. It was not until Moses came on the scene that Moses began to write. Moses, we know, he wrote the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, what else? Come on, talk to me now. Leviticus, what else? Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? Moses also wrote the book of Job. Did you know that? Moses, yes, Moses wrote Job when he was exiled in the Midian desert when he fled from Pharaoh. And Moses also wrote one or two songs right now. So guess what now? Verbally, we're talking about now when, when Adam got the revelation from God, Adam, Adam gave it to Seth orally. Now, can you imagine how huge man's mind were to retain all this stuff? Today, friends, if you lose your cell phone, you're in problem. If you don't have iCloud, you're in trouble. Because we're not using our memory as we should. But back then, these men and women, they taxed the mind. So Adam told Seth. Seth told Enos verbally all the words. Enos told Canaan. Canaan told Mahaliah. And Mahaliah told Jared. And that was how it was passed down from generation to generation. And so guess what now? So between Adam and Moses... There was 2,500 years of oral teaching. It was not until Moses came on the scene now that Moses began to write things down. Now, someone once said, fill in now. They said that the Old Testament, fill in it now, it's so profound. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Did you get that? that, that, that that's like a mind twister. The Old Testament is is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Amen. Now that's, that, that's deep to wrap your mind around, brothers and sisters. And what is happening now in society, many people are trying to set the Old Testament at arrival with the New Testament. And what they believe now, they believe that the old and the new are at war. Like Russia and Ukraine. Right? No, friends. There is a complete harmony with the old and the new. They complement each other like rice and peas. Is that right? Yeah. Like collard greens and biscuit. Talk to me now, right? You know that one? You don't know collard greens and biscuit? Hey, y'all don't know no southern in this place, right? But the point is, brothers and sisters, there is they, they complement each other, the old and the new. Now let's take a look now at this book. Now, there are three things every book must have. Every book must have these three things, and which includes the Bible. What are they? Fill it in now. Every book must have a central figure or a central person. You read a book. Whether it's a, 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 you know, a history book or a romance book or whatever, that book must have a central figure. Who is the main person in this book? So the central figure or the central person in the book is who? Guess what now? In Luke 24, we find these words, verse 27. The Bible says now, Jesus says now, And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded unto them all the things of the scriptures, that concern what? Himself. In John chapter 5, verse 39, we find these words. Now, John says, now, Jesus says what? Search the who? Scriptures, for in them you think you have life, but these are they that testify or teach is of me. So, friends, the central figure or the central person in the Bible is who? Is Jesus and friend? Did you know that every story, every parable, every situation, every text, every chapter points to Jesus? Yes. It was said in ancient times, all roads led to Rome. It was true, friends. All verse, all story, all analogies, all parables, all prophecies in the Bible point to Jesus. And as we go to the Bible, the person who we want to get a revelation of is Jesus. Jesus is the central figure. He is the central person in the Bible. Now, every book has a central figure and a central person, but the second thing every book must have is this now. Every book must have a central theme. We've all been to, what is the theme of this book? What is the author trying to convey? What is the central theme of the Bible? In Matthew 1, 21, Matthew tells us what is the central theme in the Bible. Matthew said this now, 
And she, Mary, Gabriel speaking now, shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, or Yeshua HaMashiach. And he shall what? Save his people, not in their sins and with their sins, but from their sins. In Acts chapter 19, verse 9 now, the, Bible, the Apostle Luke writes now, And Jesus said to him, This day is what? Salvation. Come to this house. So guess what? The central theme of the Bible is salvation. God is trying to save you and to save me, as a matter of fact, in a powerful book called Education. The author, this is such a profound uh, uh, and a thought-provoking paragraph. The author says now, the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other theme of the whole book clusters is the what? Is the what? What's that word? The redemption. Now you gotta talk to me now for I like I like feedback. Is the what? Is the redemption plan and the restoration in the human soul of the image of God. So, friends, as you read this book, a restoration will take place in your heart. God will restore your mind, He'll restore your marriage, He'll restore that which is salvage. Restoration is a central theme. And I have known people who were stone crazy, who were on medication, mess, literally, when they came in contact with this book, they were made whole. So every book has a central figure, a person, every book has a central theme, but also every book has an author. Every book has an author, whether it's a ghostwriter, right? You know who are ghostwriters, right? There are people today who actually pay people to write books. And they take the credit. And the person who writes the book, they call him a ghostwriter. Means he stays out of sight. He stays in the background. And guess what? He doesn't get any accolades. He may get some money on, on, you know, behind the scene. But, and most of the preachers who you have heard say they write 20, 30 books. If you were to be honest, most of these books were written by ghostwriters. It's a profitable business if you are into that kind of thing, right? So every book has an author. Now, question number three now. So who is the author of the Bible? We need not guess. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, Peter says now, Peter says this now, For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of men, but holy men spake as they were moved, they were massaged, they were maneuvered by the who? The Holy Ghost. There is your ghost author right there. The Holy Ghost. And in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 2, Jeremiah says now, Jeremiah says, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write, Jeremiah, all the words that I have spoken in, the, in this book. So friends, who is the author filling it now? It was holy man. Used by the Holy Ghost. There it is. That's the author. Now let me illustrate in a practical way because this is a teaching seminar. Um, my friend, do, we, do I still have my arm lapel mic? Not yet? All right. Now let me illustrate this now. Right? Holy man moved by the Holy Ghost now. Here we have the Holy Ghost, which is the hand. You see it on the screen, right? But then we have the pen in the hand. Now, you're writing. Now, who guides the pen? Is it the pen that guides you or you guide the pen? You guide the pen. So, friends, here we have the Holy Ghost. Is the hand and it's guiding the pen. You see, the pen or the men were in the, were in the hands of the Holy Ghost and he used them. Right? He used them. What happened right there? Right? Went blank? All right. Your handout says now, while well, they get me back on the screen, your handout says now, right? He says, I'll read their last paragraph on page one now. The writers of the Bible were the pen in the hands of the who? Of the Holy Ghost. Because the scriptures were written in different ages by men who differed widely in rank and occupation and mental and spiritual endowment. The books of the Bible presents a wide contrast of style as well as diversity 
in its nature and subject unfold. Different forms of expression are employed by different writers. Often the same truths is more strikingly presented by one than the other. God spoke through his Holy Spirit and inspired prophets to write down his messages. Although they record these messages in their own words, the message of the Bible comes directly from God and from the Bible. Am I back on screen, please? Coming? All right. Second paragraph says now, right? The one that Castling once, who Castling now, he was actually a, 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 a good author. He said now, the wonderful volume in reality of library filled with history, law, ethics, Poor prophecy, poetry, medicine, and perfect rules for the conduct of personal and social life. It contains all kinds of writings, but what a jumble it would be if Sisyphus books were written in this way by older men. Suppose, for instance, that you get 66 medical books written by 35 or 40 different doctors. Bind them all together and attempt to doctor a man with the book. Suppose you get 35 ministers to write a book on theology and then see if you can find a letter strong enough to hold the books together. Friends, what we're trying to say is in this book you're going to find a but test it. One, two, three. Test one, two, three. Nothing yet. I'm back on the screen. I don't know what's going on. Alright? So here we find, brothers and sisters, that even though the Bible was written by different men, because of their mental and their educational background, guess what? They are all going to convey the same truths in a different manner. Case in point. That's Oakland Park right there. You're going west to university. You meet an accident. The police officer comes now. And there were two witnesses who sees who saw it. One was a philosopher. This man had he has gone to to Nova University. He has gotten his, his bachelor, his his masters, and his doctor. So he has a huge vocabulary. Yeah. And then you have an ordinary man who is not so educated. Both men saw the accident. Yeah. Now when the police officer comes to take a statement, guess what? Do you think the man that has gone to the university will convey what he saw in the same way which the man who is uneducated? No. no. Based on your education, you are capable, are able to articulate. Yeah? yeah. Now, just because a man uses ABC and does use XYZ, it doesn't take away from his knowledge. So you're going to find that some Bible authors, writers, were more complex, like the Apostle Paul. Some were more simple, like Peter, who was a fisherman. Lord, save me. You see, that's simple. But the Apostle Paul was more complex in his writings. Now, I'm on the screen. I, I, need, I, I need to see tonight, so you better help me out, please, all right? Now, we talk about, you can't see it. Right? We talked about pens. That the Holy Ghost, right, were the, uh, the all right. You got me up there? All right. I, I need, okay, good. Now, so here we have a slide full of different pens. Now, I'm a lover of pens. Now, be honest. There are certain pens you can't write with. I don't like fine, fine point pens. My pens have to be round. Isn't that right? So your words have to flow. Different pens write differently. Right? I'm going to tell you the truth. So I was outside the country conducting a campaign. And there was a man who would come out every night to the meetings. And he was a millionaire. And so at the end of the meeting, he gave me a gift. I thought he was going to give me some money. <laughs> the man gave me a nice bag. I thought, oh, I'm getting some, some like good old money now. The man gave me a pen. I'm like, in an age where I need to pay my bills, you know what I'm saying? Car notes due, you know what I'm saying? I got to pay my metro bill. You know what I'm 
You gonna give me a pen? That pen was worth fifteen hundred dollars. Listen, I, I left it. I, should, I, 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 I left it at the house. Actually, in my socks drawer. I keep it for my kids. Because when Tom, money looking funny, I was going to sell that bag. You know what I'm Literally, he gave me a pen that was worth $1,500. That pen is so heavy. Literally. I didn't know pens cost that much. And so my point is now, we see a variation of pens, but these pens symbolize a variation of authors that God uses. And so each pen you see can symbolize a various author that God will use to write. So as you read the Bible, you're going to see different authors convey the same truth in a different way. But guess what? They are not contradicting each other. It's how they express themselves. Haslin once wrote this wonderful, this wonderful book. This. Hold on. I think I read that. All right, I read it. All right, all right. Now, okay, let's let's move on. Yeah, read that one. Okay, fine. Let's now look at its inspiration now. Now, question four now says now. Now, since the Bible, follow me now, was written by human beings, how much of it is actually inspired? The Bible says in Second Timothy chapter three verse sixteen. Now, Paul says all. Now, where I'm from, I used to attend school in Jamaica, a school called Kingsway. And I was one of those boys who was a little bit mischievous. And I had a teacher, her name was Mrs. Mirage. And she would say to us, show all your work. And I would miss that part. And I would go up now and hand her my work, and she would say, Mr. Knott, what part of all don't you understand? The A or the LL? All means all, all scripture, the Bible says, is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrines and reproof and corrections for instructions in righteousness. So, friends, tell now, all of it is inspired. Don't let them fool you or deceive you in believing that the Old Testament or the New Testament is more inspired than the New. All of it is inspired, brothers and sisters. As a matter of fact, someone once said, that the Bible, the Old Testament contains 593,493 words, and the New Testament contains 181,023 words, gives a total of 774,074 74, 74, And guess what? All of it is inspired. And Jesus says, Man shall not live by alone. but by what? Yes. Every word. And every word means 774,000. Seven words. That's a whole lot of word to live by. All of it is inspired. No. The Apostle Paul doesn't say some sections of are inspired. But rather, God inspires both Old and God inspires both the New Testament. Now, follow me now. Now. Verse 5 says, now, now, what are some of the indispensable objects that the Bible is compared to? Now, there's a TV program, there's a program on TV which I don't really watch, but you can't help but say it's called a naked. These are people who are lodged on an island somewhere. They are naked, bare as they are nude. And they are given each an object to use for survival. I've never seen a person taking a cell phone. No. no. They eat either, in most cases, they get either a lighter or a machete. Symbolizing, I can survive without a cell phone. Somebody said, no, we can't. <laughs> I need my cell phone. Right? But what they're saying is that these are objects in life you cannot live without. Now, there are some objects in life that the Bible is compared in contrast to which friends we cannot live without. The feeling of the Bible is compared to what we call, let me open it up, it's compared to light. Friends, you can't live without light. Before God ever made a bird or a fish or a tree or man, he said, let there be light. We need light. We need light to guide us. And that's why David says now in Psalms that thy word is a what? Lamp or a light. And we need 
light because we live in a darkened world with darkened mentality and darkened on you have some dark people out there man the word of God is compared to light but the word of God is also compared to fire it warms us is that right it keeps us warm in these cold times friends we need fire to cook with to boil water is that right you cannot live without fire. You cannot. The word of God is compared to fire. The word of God is also compared to a sword. Something sharp. Now unlike the butcher is a surgeon. One cuts to kill and one cuts to heal. The word of God doesn't cut to kill. It cuts to heal. These are objects which we cannot live without. But guess what? It's also compared to a hammer. Jeremiah 29 says, Is not my word a hammer? And because a hammer is used to break things in pieces. Isn't that right? Friends, if you want to drive a nail in this wall, you can't get your dainty shoes to drive it. You need a hammer. You need a hammer to drive uh, the nails in the wall, right? The word of God is also compared to food. Do we need food? Yeah. Yes, and what the food is to your body, the word of God is to your soul. Amen. One makes you physically fit, the other makes you spiritually fit. Amen. One gives you strength to go out there to make a living, the other gives you strength to make a life. Amen. The word of God is compared to food, but at last, the word of God is compared to seeds. I'm kind of going in and out. I don't know what's going on. What's going on? Are, we, are we all good? All right. The word of God is compared to seed. No, then friends. One author said that all that threaten to extinguish it have aided it. Profound. And proves every day how transient is the noblest monuments that man had can build. How endearing the least word of God spoken. Traditions have dug grave for it. Intolerance have lit many of faggots. Many a Judas have betrayed it with a kiss. Many a Peter have denied it with an oath. Many Demases have forsaken it. But guess what? The word of God still endures forever. There's a man by the name of William Tyndale. And he lived in the early 16, 1700s. There's a powerful movie out, and I encourage you to watch it. It's entitled God's Outlaw. William Tyndale lived in an era where the Bible was not readily available to people. It was shut up by the church in an unknown tongue. And one day, uh, William Tyndale, he saw a clergyman. And the record said, now a clergyman hopelessly entrenched in Roman Catholic dogmas once taunted Tyndale with a statement, we better be without God's laws and the Pope's. Tyndale replied, I, Tyndale was infuriated with such Roman Catholic heresies and replied, I defy the Pope and all his laws. And if God spare my life many years, I will cause a boy that drives a plow to know more scriptures than you do. Amen. Friends, did you know that the Bible you possess in your hand tonight has the blood of William Tyndale on it? Yes. Could you imagine the world without a copy of the English Bible, friends? Mm -hmm. It was William Tyndale who took the painstaking task of translating the Bible in its mother tongue into English. Amen. And because of this crime, on September 6, the year 1536, William Tyndale was strangled by the church for seeking to transcribe the Bible in English. Tonight, the Bible you possess in your hands, it has the blood of William Tyndale on it. And he loved his life even until death. And when they, when they were about to strangle Tyndale, the record said, his last words he uttered before they strangled him and burned his body. He quoted Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8 where Isaiah says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, 
but the word of our God shall stand forever. I thank God for William Tyndale and his courage and his tenacity. Now let's look at its usefulness now. The Bible is, is, is good, it, 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 it is useful. Question number four now, right? Six? Six, I need to change it. Question six says now, the Bible is good for four things, what are they? Now here are the four things, now there are other things. I'm going to highlight four now. Paul says now, all scriptures are given by inspiration of God and it is profitable. Means good for what? It is good for doctrine. Tell it is good for doctrine. What's a doctrine? A doctrine is a set of beliefs or belief held and taught by a church or a congregation. Friends, every congregation, every church in America or in this world have some doctrines. Now you've heard of the phrase that they call themselves non-denominational church. Yeah. You've heard that? Yeah. That means that they are not really affiliated with any denomination. Yeah. But I've never heard a church call themselves non-doctrinal church. Every church has some doctrines. Every church has some teachings. So friends, as we turn the word of God, we will, we will find doctrines. Doctrines are not a bad thing. Now, even though the Bible is good for doctrines, watch this now. Although the scriptures, also the scriptures, Jesus and his apostles warned his followers to avoid two kinds of doctrines. Friends, not every doctrine is a good doctrine. Jesus speaks of the doctrines of men. These are people who go to the Bible and extract and extrapolate their own ideologies. You see, and they guide or are misguiding people to hell. And there was a time in history where people would use the Bible to check the preacher. Today, they're using the preacher to check the Bible. We have to beware of the doctrines of men. These are not God's doctrine. Jesus also told us to beware of the doctrines of devils. There are some doctrines that the devil himself has invented. And I'm going to show you, friends, as you come out to these meetings, we're going to expose and expound upon the doctrines that the devil himself has cultivated. And millions of people are believing these doctrines today as if it was a thus saith the Lord. As a matter of fact, you know, I tell the story about where I go. You know, the other day, my mother called me. And she said, son, my hand has scratched me. And she said, what did the Bible say about that? I said, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. She said, yeah, man, I read it somewhere, man, that when your hand scratch you. I said, mommy, if your hand scratch you, means you want to scratch it back. And if it's keep on scratching, you need to go to see a doctor. You say, check yourself into the hospital. There is no text that says in front of you. You're going to find us, us we are governed by, 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 by fairy tales. And there are things that people are hold in dearly in churches that Peter, James, and John never heard about. They are doctrines of devils. And they must be denounced. And they must be abandoned. Amen. So we want to avoid the doctrines of men. Man's teachings, man's philosophies, Mind's ideologies. We must avoid the doctrines of devils. Even the devil himself have formed some doctrine. We don't want that, right? But Solomon says, I give you good doctrines. There's good doctrines in the Bible, amen? And these are the doctrines of Jesus. Now, so the Bible is good for doctrines. We get our doctrines from the Bible. Not from pamphlets or magazines or the we get our doctrines. As a matter of fact, I would not encourage anybody to go to a church where the, the, the church's doctrines cannot be found in the Bible. Ask your pastor, Pastor, where do you get that from? Give me a thus said the Lord. Give me a, a scripture and a text to substantiate what you're saying. Yeah? So it's good for doctrine, 
But it's not just good for doctrine, right? It's also good for the proof. It's good for doctrine. Fill it now. It's also good for what is reproof? Reproof simply is telling us when we are wrong willfully. There are people out there right now who are doing things that are wrong and they know it is wrong. The Bible wants to correct them. Someone once said, an old preacher once said, this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. It's very hard to read this Bible and live in sin. It does something to you. You cannot read it honestly and still continue living a disobedient lifestyle. It, it will correct you. It's good for reproof. Yeah? And the Bible says, Whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. Right? So it's good for reproof. People who are doing things wrong willingly. So it's good for doctrines. It's good for reproof. But Paul says it's also good for corrections. Now, someone say, Isn't reproof and correction the same thing? No. Correction is a little bit lighter than reproof. Correction means, means to instruct those who are ignorantly doing wrong. So there are many people in society who just don't know. Ignorant. If you ask me to play the piano, I am ignorant of it. it means I don't know how to play the piano. You see, ignorant. And guess what? There are many people now, the Apostle Paul says now, for I passed by and beheld your devotion, and I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you worship what? In other words, they were worshiping, they were worshiping, they were worshiping the right God in the wrong way. Ignorantly. They didn't know. And a lot of things you will learn from this means you just didn't know. Nobody's here condemning you. The Bible wants to correct you. Yeah? Right? Now, ignorant means to not, not to know. It means not to understand. It means to err or to sin through a mistake to be wrong. A lot of people are sincere people, are sincere Christians. They love the Lord. Your Holy Ghost filled. Your water baptized. They love Jesus with all their heart and soul and mind. But they are doing some things wrong ignorantly. We're not condemning them. We're seeking to correct them. And through these meetings, I believe God wants to correct somebody. And so today, many are worshiping the right God in wrong ways. Friends, the Bible speaks of ignorant worship. The right God. And did you know that God did not leave man to prescribe the mode of worship? God wrote down how we ought to approach him in worship. The Bible is good for doctrine, for correction, for reproof. But the Bible is also good for a fourth thing, instruction in righteousness. The Bible will instruct us in right doing. It will restore people and improve their lives and their character. So friends, as you read the Bible, as you come out to these meetings, expect to get four things every night except Monday. You will get doctrines, yeah? You will get reproofs, yeah? You will get corrections, yeah? But you will also get instruction in righteousness. And what is righteousness? Right doing. As you leave this place, you will know how to walk straight even in a crooked world, amen? Now, let's now transition to understanding truth. Question number seven now says now, the Apostle Paul encourages us to do what in order to understand truth? Look what Paul says now. Paul says now that we're going to have to do what? Study. Yes. Study. Friends, if we want to understand Bible truth, we're going to have to do what? Study. Now that word study, that word study, it comes from a Greek word. Not in your handout. Yes, it is. It means the word study comes from a Greek word means school dad zoo. Let's repeat it. 
Spoon died soon. One more time. This side only. I want to go speak over that side. This side only. Now, we all know Greek now. See, you know a Greek word, some spudazu. Text some spudazu, Facebook spudazu. When Paul said study, it means spudazu. It means, you got feel it, it means to be diligent. That's what Paul means. It also means to go forward. You know, I have a brother, he's a Rasta man. And every time we part, he said, I am forward. <laughs> he said, Rasta man, go backward. Rasta man, go forward. Friends, as we study God's word, we're going forward and onward and upward. Yeah. As you study, it also means to labor, friends. Charles Spurgeon once said, sometimes inspiration comes through perspiration. I'm sweating right now, brothers and sisters. <laughs> you're going to have to sweat this thing out. Some things you're going to have to grapple with and get a pen and paper and mass it out. Yeah. Yes, it also means to exert oneself. It means to hasten. Why must we hasten? Because the time is short and the devil has come down with great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. And if you're not serious, and I'm not serious, let me tell you the devil is serious. It also means to dig deep. So friends, as you come out to these meetings night after night, we go do some school that zoo. Matter of fact, I want to encourage you Bring an extra, uh, uh, extra uh, uh, air tank and we're going to go deep. I read somewhere that when divers want to go deep, they grab hold of a dolphin. And that dolphin just penetrates tonight. We're going to grab hold of the Holy Ghost. He's going to take us in the deep things of God. And so the question is, how much time do we really spend studying the Bible? How much time do you spend? There's a powerful book. It's called The Great Controversy. And I will refer to it from time to time in this series. A powerful book written by a lady over a hundred years ago. And this book is so powerful. Look what the author said. The author said now, this is so profound. Satan is constantly endeavoring to attract attention to man in the place of God. He leads people to look to bishops, to pastors, to professors of theology as their guide instead of searching the scriptures for themselves. Then by controlling the minds of these leaders, he can influence the masses to do his will. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. We need pastors, yeah? We need professors. But, but your pastor, my pastor, the pastor of this church, is only as is only good as he is following this book. Amen. Did you hear what I said, brothers? And sisters? I don't care how he looks or how he dresses or how much degrees he has. If your pastor is not following this book, he's no good. The pastor is only as good as he is following this book. And I would encourage anybody to sit under a pastor who is not following this book. As a matter of fact, look what the Apostle Paul says. Paul says, hey, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. The pastor is only as good as he's following Jesus and following the words of this book. No, friends, it is very important to study the Bible for ourselves. We cannot rely on what others tell us. God invites us to go on on a personal discovery of truth in his words. And so let me give you some tips now that will assist you and aid you as you study the word of God for yourself. Tip number one, always begin studying the Bible with prayer. I would not encourage anyone to open this book without prayer. Because the devil is there to confuse you, to misguide you in your understanding. The Bible must never. That's why every night we begin with prayer. I'm not smart enough. 
And as you pray, you must say, Lord, open my eyes. Teach me, dear God. Secondly, you must study it through. Never begin a day without mastering the word. Did you hear, friends? Always read your Bible in the morning. A chapter, a verse, a book. Number three, pray it in. Never leave your Bible until the passage you have studied is a part of your very being. I want to live out. Fourthly, put it down. Put the thought that God gives you in the margin of your Bible or a notebook. Next point to consider, work it out. Live the truth you get through all the hours of the day. And then fourthly, lastly, pass it on, friends. Seek to tell somebody what you have learned from the Bible. These are good tips that will assist you in your quest for truth. Now, question number eight now, says that we wind out now. Now, when one begins to read God's book, what twofold effect will it have upon them? In Revelation chapter 10, we see now that John takes the Bible, the book, and the chapter he's reading is the book of, is the book of Daniel. And as he reads it now, it has a twofold effect. Look what happened now. The Bible says now, right? John says now, Revelation 10 now, says now, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it up now, it didn't mean he literally ate it. It's metaphorically. Somebody said to you, girl, you, 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 man, I, I, man, I tore that book up. It didn't mean you actually tore it up. It meant you read it. Mastered it. So when he said he ate it up, it meant he what? He read it. And it was in my mouth what? Sweet. Like mm, 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 mm. honey. And as soon as I ate it, it, but in my belly it was bitter, brothers and sisters. Friends, as you begin to word the read of God, you're going to get almost a twofold effect. Some things are going to be sweet. Mm -mm, mm, thank you, Jesus. But some parts are going to be bitter. God is going to ask you to make some serious changes in your life. Friendships may have been broken up. You will have a sweet and a bitter one. Sweet and bitter. I remember when I first came to Jesus, I was attending Florida International University of Miami, FIU. I was a starting forward for the men's Division I NCAA soccer team. I was recruited from Stranahan. And I was on full scholarship. And as I began to read the word of God, God was calling me into ministry. And I had decided now it's time for me to leave the university and to pursue my theological studies. Friends, when I left, I did not realize how great an impact I had on the, my friends at FIU. My coach, he was called, he was called Karl Kremser from Germany, about 6'3", and the other coach was Munga from Africa. Those men cry. Bitter and sweet. I had to say goodbye to my friends and my, and, and, and my team. And up until this day, I see them on passing on, on Facebook. But as you begin to read the word of God, you will have a sweet effect. And a bitter. It's almost like eating some tamarind. Lord have mercy. Woo! Woo! Boy, it is sweet in your mouth, but it's a bitter taste when that thing's. You're talking about parts of that. Talk to somebody. Amen. Do listen. Amen. Some things will be sweet, but some things will be bitter. You will face the bitter reality. Now, the challenge now many have as they read the Word of God. Question 9 says now. Why do some people have difficulty understanding Bible truth? Why do some get it and some don't? Now, this is one of the reasons why many people have difficulties. 
The Bible says in Mark chapter 7 verse, 7 verse 9, Jesus says now, he said to them, fully reject the commandments of God that he may keep your own traditions. The reason why many people have difficulty understanding the Bible is not that because they are dumb or they are dunce or they are done. It is because suddenly now they are unwilling to give up preconceived ideas, Philippine, and family traditions. My, 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 my mama taught me this, and my mama was a good woman, but what your mama taught you ain't in the Bible. Well, I don't care what you say, I'm going to hold to my mama. Right? Traditions. Now, we do have some good traditions, is that right? Yeah. Every culture has some traditions, is that right? You know, in the Jamaican culture, we have we have some good traditions. What is every Sunday you get some rice and peas? That's, that's a good tradition. Yeah. But we also have some very bad traditions that we we want to follow. But the reason why many people don't advance or under because they are unwilling. You have to learn to let go and let go. And as you come out to these meetings, friends, you have to come with an open mind. To see what God is going to say to you as you study these truths. And as God reveals truth to you, no, now we're told, someone said, understanding the Bible is difficult for some people because of their unwillingness to give up their own ideas, such as, I feel, well, I think, my opinion is, etc. God invites us to seek his ways, not our own. He invites us to turn from our what? Pride of our what? Own understanding and to humbly accept his revealed will out of his word. And if you take that position, you will grow in the Bible. Your knowledge of the Bible will expand. You will become a student and a teacher of this book. And friends, listen. We have over 28 lectures. If you were to make a pledge, say, Lord, come hell or high water, come hurricane, come rain, I'm going to make it my duty to come to carve out of my 24 hour day just one hour to come out of this. Meeting. I guarantee you, by the time these meetings are over, you would have grown exponentially in the Bible. As a matter of fact, you would be qualified to come and do what I'm doing. And by the way, that is my objective. When, when these meetings are ending, it is my hope and my prayer that you can take these lessons and go and teach your family. Amen. Teach your loved ones. Amen. Teach your community. I challenge you. People have challenge all the time. You know, one month challenge, I challenge you. Members and visitors to come out every night and see what God will do for you. Now, the essentials. What attitude is essential to understand Bible truth? Now, Jesus said now, but if you walk in the light, as he in the light, and have what? Fellows one another, the blood of Jesus Christ and his son doth cleanse us from all sins. John 2, 5 says now, his mother said to him and his servants, whatsoever he saith, do it. Friends, if we want to advance in truth, we must have an obedient attitude. Amen. Whatever God says, just do it. Amen. Huh? You know in the army, I remember, man, I, when I was in high school, you know, my... I, they said I was a bad boy, but I was just misunderstood to be honest. My mother wanted me to join the army. And I remember one day, man, I had a whole pastor. And those men came to my house. Boom, 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 boom. Knocking at my door, I did the ASDAP test. I hit on the bed. You know <laughs> and I remember a, a, a strand hand. We had ROTC, boy. And I would see those, those guys and, and young ladies, man. They were every Thursday, they would dress in their uniform. And when they had their drill, man, they would be shouting. And they would be saying, yes, sir. They don't argue. They just do what they are told. 
I want to give you a true story. Did you know where the slogan, Just, Just Do It, came from? It came from this guy. His name was Gary Gallimore. Now, Just Do It is a, is a slogan for Nike. Gary Gallimore, the very says now, Gary Gallimore demanded the death penalty as punishment for his crimes. So he was damned to die for his crimes. Reggae said now, his execution by firing squad took place on January 19, 1977. Now, the record said now, Gallimore uttered his haunting last words before he was shot. He just says, let's do it. Let's do it. A moment of silence and the air shattered with sounds of rifle fire. Let's do it. Just do it was borrowed from Let's Do It. Then in 1988, an advertising agency, Wendell Kennedy Agency, Daniel and Credits, the inspiration to Just Do It, from the slogan to Gary Gallimore's last words, Let's Do It. And today, Just Do It is a million dollar slogan. But friends, you know long before Nike offered that slogan, didn't Jesus say his mother, whatsoever he say, just do it. That was where really, Nike should credit the Bible. That's where it came from. Whatsoever he said, just do it. Whether big or small, whatsoever. And friends, if you take that attitude, you will grow. Just do it now. No, friends. And I said the Bible largely depends on willingness to do whatever God requires. The Bible study is not simply a mental exercise. It is a hard experience. If you are willing to do whatever God asks in his word, he will guide you into his truth. I want to leave you with a powerful phrase. You may want to take a picture of this and put it on your social media. Is this. Your attitude, more than your aptitude, will determine your altitude. Lord, have mercy. That, that, that's a tongue twister. Let me say it again. In regards to the Bible, your attitude, more than your aptitude. What's aptitude? Great. Great. So it's not so much your mental academia that's important. It is your attitude will determine your attitude. And the reason why many people can never take off is because when they read the Bible, they have a bad attitude. Bring the right attitude to God's book and you will grow and glow. Now, as we wind down, question number 11. The method. The what? What method of Bible study is especially helpful in discovering God's truth? And friends, throughout this meeting, we'll be using this method. Isaiah said this now. Whom shall I teach knowledge? Whom shall he make understand doctrine? Doctrine. Them that are weaned from the middle, drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. And upon line, here a little, and there a little. One more text. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13, Paul says now, which things we speak, not in words which man was not teach it, but with the Holy Ghost teach it, comparing spiritual things with what? Spiritual. So, friends, if we want to, the best method that you can ever use, Bible study, fill it now, is by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Not Bible with Internet. Scripture with Scripture. Or Scripture with Google. No. If you read a text and there is some obscurity in what John said, then turn to Isaiah. Isaiah would shed light on what John said. We're going to use Scripture to unlock Scripture. That's the best method we can use. No, let's suppose you're putting together a jigsaw puzzle. Do you come to a conclusion about what the finished picture would look like 
without first looking at the original picture. Well, I've done puzzles. First rule, I've done like 20 piece puzzles. <laughs> and that's the struggle, right? But, so the first rule is this now. You look at the picture, the puzzle. Then you spread it out. Then the rule is the edges. That's why I'm in the middle. That's why, that's why I get it wrong, right? And you work your way in. Look what happened now. Certainly not. It is the same with God's word. God invites us to use all texts on a given subject before coming to what? A conclusion regarding the Bible, what the Bible teaches. Friends, you cannot come to a conclusion about a doctrine without getting ample texts about what the Bible says. Look what Proverbs says now. Solomon says in Proverbs 18 verse 13, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it is a fool. Amen. You know you have some people before you and no 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 no, no, no let me finish. No 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 I know what you're going. You know what I'm going to say. But says you're a fool. Let the person speak, then you answer. So you cannot really answer a Bible question without first one letting the Bible talk to you. Amen. Second principle now. John chapter seven fifty one says now. Doth Jesus, doth your law judge any man before you hear him? Which man is going to be sentenced to life in prison? Then we're going to have the trial. You would sue that judge. You have the trial first. You hear the evidence. Then the jury draws a conclusion. That's why in court, that lady She's blindfolded. You know why? With two scales. Meaning that justice is what? Blind. blind. No, she peeks sometimes. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. Some of you folks will get off. Mm -hmm. I wonder what courtroom they sat in. Mm -hmm. But the point is, friends, no. The Holy Spirit leads us in our Bible study. Interpreting line upon line, text after text, we will know the truth of God's word. God has not left us alone in our pursuit of truth. He has promised the Holy Spirit to guide us by allowing one passage of scripture to explain another passage. So friends, as you come out to these meetings, I guarantee you this. You will receive more Bible texts than you you ever received in your entire life on one particular subject. You know today, friend, in the average churches today, the average pastor, he takes one little text. He reads half a text. Shut the Bible. Look at me, now look at me. And then talking, laughing, dancing, spinning, whooping, holler. And that's it. And you live saying, girl, he, he preached today. What did he preach about? I don't know. Man, it was good. I mean, it was good to the emotion, but not good to the senses. We must let the Bible speak to us. And as I close now, the effect. As we look at God's word, what effect? Question number 12 says now, what will happen to our lives as we study God's word? No, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter says, whereby, whereby are we given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Jude chapter 124 says now, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Friends, as we read the do this, I feel it now, we will be kept from corruption. And we'll be kept from falling into the basin. Sins. God's word will keep us mentally, Amen. keep us morally. Amen. He will keep the youth and the young people. Amen. And what society needs today is not more politicians. We don't need no more laws. What we need is for people to start reading the word of God and it will keep them. Alexander MacLeod tells a story. He says, he tells of two young men who crept at night into a factory to discover 
the secret of a new machine that a clever man had invented. So they could make secret drawings of it and enrich themselves. But while still in the hotel room, before heading across town for the factory, one of them saw a Bible on the table. Picking it up, it seemed to open in his eyes to Exodus 20. And he read the Ten Commandments. When he came to the eighth one, he could not go further. Its words seemed to flash like fire and smoke his conscience. Thou shalt not steal. Those men went home without the secret of the machine, but with the secret of personal power. Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed to the word of God. And as I close, I'll leave you with a true story. A number of years ago, a wealthy Englishman grew sick and died. When the day came for, his, for the reading of his will, and distribution of his fortune that he had left. His favorite daughter was bitterly disappointed. Why? The father had designated that in his will she was to receive my Bible and all its contents. Knowing that her fa father was an ardent student of the Bible, that, that, that this book was never, was, was nearer and dearer to his heart, she hid it away in an old trunk and went on living as before. As time passed, adversity seemed to dog her steps. Ill health and difficulty reduced her to poverty. Broken in health and in spirit, in desperation she sought a solution to her problems. After trying every other means available to her, she turned to her father's Bible seeking the answer to her difficulties. Imagine her surprise that as she leaped leaf through the long forgotten book to find that between many Bible passages her father had scattered large bank notes of England. She had been wealthy all the time of her life but had been unaware of her good fortune because she had failed to recognize what her father had meant when he had given her my Bible and all its contents. Friends, our Heavenly Father has left us a great treasure in pages of this wonderful book. We may not be able to find banknotes between its pages of the Bible, but we can find peace, joy, hope, faith, and eternal life by studying the book. Priceless treasures, forgotten riches, what greater treasure can a man hope for? A millionaire would exchange his fortune for these values. So as we close, I appeal to you by saying, read the word. Study the word. Believe the word. Obey the word. Share the word. Cherish the word. Pass on the word. Are you blessed tonight, friends? Yes. Listen now, take out your appeal card now. Take out your appeal card. Everyone was given an appeal card. Take it out now, friends, as we close. Now, tonight's title was filling it now. The truth about God. Everybody needs to fill this out tonight. What it does, it gauges me. Because I go through them every night. It lets me know where you are in your level of comprehension. Tonight's topic was the truth about God's word. Tonight, friends, you have sat based on my clock for a little over an hour. Hearing truths of the word. Now tonight, if you understand and believe what the Bible teaches about tonight's subject and it is your desire to follow what it says just put a check by that box just let Jesus know you sat you came you sat you understood and perchance as you sat 
the information that was presented was not really clear and you need additional clarification if that is your situation right now please check that box I hope not tonight as you sit you say I am struggling with a particular sin and I need victory in Jesus over that sin if that is your plea tonight just please check that box we at this we believe in prayer we are praying for you. If you need us to keep you on our prayer list, just please check that box. And perchance, you may need the pastor or the evangelist to stop by your casa, your house, your domain for a visit, to talk to you, to talk with you, to pray with you, to work through some problems. If you're looking for a, a visit, now we do our visitations on Mondays. Mondays is our off days, but we can make exceptions. Please check that box. Now, of all, give us your name, please. Please write your name legibly. And just give us your, 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 your address or your phone number. Because if you want us to visit, we want to be able to contact you. Amen? And we also want to know where you stay. When you're finished, stand to your feet, please. And please pass those appeal cards to the center aisle as our ushers will come down and will collect all those appeal cards. Let us stand to our feet as we bring this service to its, its close. Please pass all those appeal cards. Ushers, please make your way down now, please. Please pass all appeal cards to the center aisle. As the ushers come on down, they're going to collect all those appeal cards. Our friends, and every person in this room needs to fill out an appeal card. No one is exempt. Every night you'll get an appeal card. Please fill one out. Were you blessed tonight, friends? I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Let us stand as we ask God's blessing as we leave from this, this place. Let us stand for prayer. Let's all stand. If you're able to. Let us pray. Most kind and loving Father in heaven. Tonight, dear God, we have embarked upon a journey in this truth series. And by your grace, we plan to make truth plain and clear to your people. Mighty God, I pray that each individual that stood would make a concerted effort every night to be here, to sit at the feet of Jesus and to learn the truths for this time, which would make them better wives, better mothers, better fathers, better sons and daughters, better citizens of this great country. Tonight there is someone who cares. He sends his words to you. There is someone who cares. His words are always true. There is someone who cares, I say. His words will guide you through. Tonight that someone who cares is Jesus. May the good Lord now bless you and keep you May the good Lord now cause his peace shine upon you. May the good Lord give you peace. Peace in your home. Peace in your heart. Peace with the Prince of Peace. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Please be seated now. Tomorrow night, you don't want to miss it. The truth about a king's dream. Why do dreams occur? You don't want to miss tomorrow night. Listen. We begin at 7 o'clock. Bring a friend. And if you can't bring a friend, then bring an enemy. If you can't bring neither, 7.15, then bring yourself, right? And we'll, we'll be over that building, right? May God bless you. Shake my hand to the Lord as we sing our Mine Eyes Have Seen. Mine Eyes Have Seen.